It's all good. Okay, excellent. Um, now that the light show is complete, um, welcome all of you to... Are you sure? Are you sure? Okay, great. Um, right. Um, welcome to uh, a discussion about brutalist architecture. Um, and given that you've all decided to do this on a Friday evening, I thought the least I could do is provide some, some films. So what I'm going to do first before I proceed to my argument is show you three clips about brutalism. All of them, and the talk in general is going to be entirely about the UK, not because I'm trying to be parochial, but for reasons that will increasingly become clear. And I'm first going to show a very short clip from a 1974 film called Living at Thamesmead. So this is a sort of propaganda film on behalf of the Greater London Council um, trying to convince people to move to their new brutalist housing estate on the edges of London, named by uh, a public poll as Thamesmead. And hopefully there is sound. Aha. Come yet? No. He will. Oh. Ta -la. Bye. Isn't it windy? Oh, I'm sorry, Sal. Ever so sorry. Anyway, there's no hurry. We've got all afternoon. That's not the point. When you say two o'clock... So, um, that, 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 that short film, which goes on in a similar vein for about another 40 minutes, um, encapsulates the sort of... the vision of brutalism that I think animated the people that actually designed and commissioned 
fruitless buildings. This is how they imagined it would be. Um, there'd be children playing, people hanging out. It would be a sort of wonderful, jolly place. And this vision had already, at the time that film was made in 1974, been supplanted of a now very, very familiar vision of brutalism. And for the one or two of you that haven't seen A Clockwork Orange, this is what I'm referring to. I've taught you much, my little droogies. Now tell me what you had in mind, Georgie boy. <laughs> oh, the old Malocco flash first, will you not say? Right? <laughs> He's coming Some to sharpen us yeah. up. Some of the Malocco flash. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. you especially, we have the start. Yeah, you guys yeah. are the first, because we've got start on you. Yeah, Malocco flash, eh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As we walked along the flat lot marina, I was calm on the outside, but thinking all the time. So now it was to be Georgie the General, saying what we should do and what not to do, and dim as his mindless, grinning bulldog. But suddenly I vidded that thinking was for the gloopy ones, and that the omni ones used like inspiration and what bog sends. For now it was lovely music that came to my aid. There was a window open with a stereo on, and I vidied right at once what to do. inspiration and what Bog sends. So um, this is the sort of very, very familiar part, sort of way that the story of brutalism generally gets told. Um, there were idealistic but possibly totalitarian and evil architects who imagined that their buildings would kind of create this utopia and then it all went bad and it was full of violent kids. And so now we have to do something about it. For an example of what's being done about it, this is the third and last of my short clips, which I won't show all of. I think about two minutes will give you an idea. So this is the first two are from Thamesmead, the Greater London Council's very, very large, brutalist housing estate on the southeast edge of London. This is of Park Hill, which is Sheffield City Council's uh, somewhat smaller but equally monumental housing estate in the centre of the city. And this is um, a short promotional piece by Park Hill's current owners. Park Hill, everyone thinks about the residential, but actually there's a lot of com commercial space, and that started with uh, Human and Uber that have taken space here, created some really interesting spaces, and then we've got a number of other creative companies, um, some really good Sheffield companies, um, Warp Films, um, Yumi, um, Cam Studios as well, and so we're looking to welcome these companies here, and that is going to give a real buzz to this place, and, add a, and a really exciting dimension. There's going to be probably about 200 people working here when all of the commercial space is fully occupied. There's some great potential restaurant and leisure spaces. Park Hill's always had four pubs. We want to get, you know, one of the best pubs or restaurants back at Park Hill. The, the space we have is um, a, a duplex space. Uh, I mean, all the apartments here at Park Hill, even the one-bedroom ones, they're all uh, on two levels. So our studio space is like that as well. And downstairs we have a, a desk formation where we can all look at each other and we also have a great view out to the city and, you know, a nice friendly space. And then upstairs we have a more 
cosy meeting space and working space. When we were looking to move, we, wanted, did, we didn't want a typical office. We wanted something, you know, um, raw. And this, when we look around here... It so, there you are. Um, you don't have to do that. Um, so, how do I start? Thank you. Um, so, um, what I'm going to be talking about is very much about what happens to brutalism after people start liking it. Um, and when asked to, 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 to talk about brutalism and the series of talks in Belgrade, a city which, of course, has an enormous amount of brutalism, I thought it would be useful to, to discuss the particular fate that it's had in, 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 in Britain as a, sort of as a sort of potentially interesting case study of how you should be careful what you wish for, actually. Um, so um, the problem of what to do about people liking brutalism is quite a novel one, I think. The conventional wisdom is that people hate this architecture, that this is the most hated architecture that's ever happened. Um, the English language, in particular, has an entire repertoire of terms specifically devised for brutalist architecture. Concrete monstrosity, carbuncle, you know, there's a whole kind of litany of this sort of stuff. Um, so the UK, is, uh, uh, as a case study, works because it's both a country which um, can probably be credited, or rather its architectural culture can be credited for coining the term brutalism. It, it derives from the Architects Architectural Association and the London County Council in the 1950s and the various terms that they devised because they all hated each other. And also because of the fact that it's a country which has always been quite resistant to architectural modernism. Um, it came very, very late to the UK. Uh, most of the major buildings are much later than they would be in France or, 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 or Germany. Um, or Sweden, or even the Soviet Union, that they're, 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 they're really, you know, art, modern architecture came to Britain almost as an export when people started fleeing Central Europe in the 1930s. Um, so brutalism kind of emerges out of these kind of quite contradictory positions. Um, and for decades, is considered the worst architecture that's ever, that's ever happened. The degree to which this architecture was demonized in the 1970s, 80s, and 1990s cannot be understated. Um, the amount of things for which this stuff was blamed, in particular. Um, I think the only architectural style that's ever been considered to have caused crime. Um, so, um, nonetheless, in 2016, in London in particular, but also in Manchester and in Sheffield, there is the very, very strange phenomena of brutalism being popular. And brutalism having, po having been popularized, and brutalism giving way to its own sort of cult and its own, its own particular kinds of, of, of kitchen trinkets and so forth. Um, something which at one point would have been um, quite inconceivable, I think. And I think in other places where this architecture is still um, under threat or considered unpopular or very dilapidated, it can be quite tempting to think, well, over there, it's become really popular. Let's, let's do that. Don't do that. So um, what we have here is two fairly typical consumer items inspired by brutalism. If you go to the shop at the Barbican, at the enormous Barbican multi-level brutalist complex in central London, um, you will find an enormous quantity of sort of brutalist uh, plates, mugs, posters, models, um, videos, books, um, postcards, cutouts, T-shirts, tote bags, and so forth. Um, and here you have just two of them. So the one at the top, these people should have precedence. I think they were well ahead of the game. This is um, one in a series of, of mugs and plates um, produced by the company People Will Always Need Plates, who have since around 2009 um, 
put out this quite extensive series of mostly London-based uh, modernist and brutalist buildings on, on, onto consumer items. So this is Trellick Tower. This is uh, Erno Goldfinger's uh, high-rise council block in uh, West London on a mug in 70s green. Um, and here below is um, a series of models by the uh, Polish designer Zupa Grafica um, of brutalist London landmarks. Um, so, and amongst the more generic council blocks, you have Space House by Richard Seifert, Balfron Tower by Erno Goldfinger, Robin Hood Gardens by Alison Peter Smithson, and The Barbican by Chamberlain Powell and Bond. And you can have your own little brutalist building. And there are other ways in which you can have your own little brutalist building, which I will come to. But before doing that, I think it's worth talking about exactly where brutalism comes from, where it derives as a term, um, and to sort of go back to its, it, it, its birth, I guess, to try and uncover some things about it. So brutalism is basically coined, uh, depending on who you listen to, either to describe a particular architectural style of quite blunt quite aggressive modern architecture that one or two architects were doing in Sweden in the 50s, but this is, I don't think, a very convincing explanation, or it is used as a nickname for the brutalist architect at Peter Smithson, and from then on, from the fact that he was nicknamed Brutus, this became the description of, of his style. And another explanation comes from the French beton bru, or raw concrete. Um, it's probably some combination of those three is why brutalism becomes brutalism. Um, but really, an essay in uh, 1957 by Rainer Bannum called The New Brutalism, Ethic or Aesthetic, is what really, really cements this term um, and where, where the idea of this comes from. So uh, this, this particular estate here, I think, is probably the point where you can detect the emergence of brutalism. Um, not as an architectural style. As an architectural style, it derives from late Le Cabozier. So it derives from the Unité d'Habitation, the Monastery at La Tourette, and the Maison Joe. That's, that's where it stylistically comes from. But if, according to Rainer Bannum, it is an ethic and not an aesthetic, it derives from this place. So this is the Alton Estate in Southwest London, um, an extremely large council estate, um, which was planned on um, basically on, the, on, on, on someone's country house. And this should be stressed, the radicalism of this. So this is a huge, um, essentially a kind of, a, kind of um, a garden for, I think, two stately homes, two upper class stately homes. And so this land had been compulsorily purchased by the London County Council, which was under the control for most of its history of the Labour Party. Um, and they proceeded to build council housing on that. And worth stressing this, because it's now a thing that politically would be considered very extreme, would be considered communist even, um, to basically take over the private gardens of the extremely rich and build housing for working class people on them. Quite unusual even at the time. Um, so that's what it is typologically. And it received lots of praise in its day for the fact that the trees of these pr large private gardens were used in the housing estate. Um, it was described by the American critic G.E. Kidder Smith as the best low-cost housing estate in the world, which it may well have been at the time. Um, but stylistically, it was divided very much into two halves. So the one above is Alton East. And this was quite typical of sort of English modern architecture in the first 10 years after 1945. Um, in a style that was called at the time the New Empiricism, and that was derived from Sweden, specifically Sweden. Um, and in the case of Bolton East, this consisted of 12-story um, brick-clad um, point blocks, as they were called, sort of set quite informally in this rolling green 
tree-filled landscape. Um, this then elicited a response from younger architects at the London County Council at Alton West, um, where you have a turn towards uh, monumentality, formalism, uh, the display of materials. So whereas both of these buildings are concrete frames, only on Alton West is the concrete on the facade. So there's this kind of almost sort of John Ruskin arts and crafts derived kind of obsession with showing you what, you, what the building is made of. And there's also this idea about buildings, um, about, about the idea and brutalism of the idea of the as found. So sort of found objects are sort of emphasized. So the chimney there at the corner of the, um, the boiler house that kind of runs the power for the, for the building, this is emphasized in the design. Rather than kind of tidying up the surfaces, you know, the, the ducting, the pipes, the chimneys, rather than kind of trying to cover these up, they are emphasized in a brutalist design. Um, so that... I think there you have all of the, all of the sort of ingredients of it. Um, all, the, well, all the things that Rainer Bannum defined as making a brutalist building, that, they that it, would be, it would present a, a, a memorable image. Um, it would have this kind of um, obsession with, with treating materials as found. And it would have a certain sort of aesthetic um, aggression. Bannum described this as a brick bat brick bat thrown in the public's face, something that you can't imagine the public being massively keen on, the idea of having a bat thrown in their face. People don't like bats in their faces. Um, but the, um, the, the sort of clarity of the, of the design is also something that's very, very noticeable about it. And that's where the kind of idea of it being an ethic comes in. There is, on the one hand, a sort of um, an architectural ethic which is about this sort of idea of truth to materials and so forth, and a sort of lack of pretension um, in the actual design of the building. Um, but also an ethic in terms of the belief that people can take this, that people will, the people that are living in buildings like this will be able to understand those aesthetic choices. Um, and also an assumption that this would be for ordinary people. This is, this is what this architecture was for. So this weird thing of like it's supposed to be a thing that would affront the public and a thing that the public would like and live in. A contradiction that I don't think was ever fully resolved. Um, so brutalism and modernism of any kind really um, falls into massive public disfavor in Britain in the 1970s. And there are really sort of two um, major moments, as it were, where, where, where that happens, where it goes from being an architecture of social progress and equality and so forth, and, and sort of futurism, to an architecture of, um, of sort of statism, totalitarianism, um, ugliness, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the two places where that happens, where this, this, this sudden shift occurs are uh, Ronan Point and Covent Garden. Now, one of these is a building which actually isn't brutalist, and one of them is a building that never actually got built. So brutalist architects would be within their rights to feel quite upset about being blamed for these two things, but blamed for them they most certainly were. So this is, was uh, Ronan Point, a 22-story prefabricated tower in East London, which collapsed after a gas explosion in May 1968, um, killing several people. A gas explosion in one of the higher flats um, just led to the panels just coming straight down. Now, of course, one th of the other things that brutalism is not, other than it's not Swedish design, is that it's not uh, prefabrication. Brutalism is very much about in situ concrete, poured concrete, about kind of concrete surfaces and the kind of enjoyment of concrete. Um, whereas panel construction is generally quite a different thing. The idea of these precast things is a quite different tradition, I think, much closer to the sort of mainstream international style. But 
given that this architecture was starting, that, that, that the kind of modern architecture of the post-war years was starting to have quite brutal effects, and that many badly built buildings were um, starting to leak, starting to have vermin, and in one case, or the one case only, actually collapsing, um, this, the, the term brutalism became increasingly unfortunate. The other example is a little bit later, so from the early 1970s, which is the Greater London Council's proposals for Covent Garden. Um, now, any of you that know London will know Covent Garden as an area that you don't really go to unless you're an American tourist. Um, but the, the reason why it became that is quite complicated. So Covent Garden was an area marked by having, on the one hand, a fruit and vegetable market, um, and quite a lot of working class housing, and also having in the opera house. So it had this kind of conflict of, um, I guess, the, the upper class and the working class. And initially the idea was that the, the market would be moved to um, a different site in South London, which it was, and all of the buildings on the site, apart from those that were recognized as being of historic value, would be demolished, and a sort of multi-level brutalist complex would be built uh, on top of it. Um, a campaign both by residents and increasingly by sort of radicalized youth um, who had sort of gone through the 1968 movement and had gone through kind of the counterculture uh, and, and had become very, very hostile to modern architecture. Everything that the counterculture wasn't, modern architecture was. Everything that hippies hated, essentially, was represented in, in, in modern architecture. Um, and the defeat of this came from within the Great London Council. Um, the architects, a group of architects at the Great London Council managed to take control of the plan and then basically listed all the historic buildings, not just the, the three that had been considered worthy of preservation, listed all the historic buildings in Covent Garden, making this plan legally impossible. So the veg fruit and vegetable market still left Covent Garden, so it increasingly became an area of, 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 of tourism. It no longer really had a point other than to kind of sell trinkets to tourists. But the, the, um, the point of it, w w which was not lost on people, was that you could defeat the plans of the big state. Um, and that the architecture of the 19th century, which in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s had ver been very much demonized, very much considered to be the worst architecture ever, much as brutalism was later on, um, was suddenly revalued to the point where all of it was of value, not just the great historic buildings, but all of it, the terraces, the warehouses, the tenements, everything, factories, whatever, all of it was of value from the 19th century, all of a sudden. And these had quite drastic effects. So um, the sort of second part of modern architecture's decline, I think, is probably its, it's depiction in punk. Um, modern architecture in, in punk has this very contradictory role. It kind of appears constantly on record sleeves and in lyrics. The Clash, in particular, go on about it all the time. Uh, the Jam have this cover here of their very, very bad second album. Um, there's also a later song by the Jam called The Planner's Dream Went Wrong, um, where, he said, where Paul Weller tells us that if God had wanted us to live in the sky, he would have given us wings. So there you go, wisdom from the Jam. Um, so um, that I think that, the, 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 that this is, uh, in punk it was considered very much a sort of alienating architecture, that this, the punk the sort of obsession with with 1984, its obsession with Eastern Europe, um, that you could find on the part of, uh, you know, Subway Sec, Joy Division, um, many kind of punk and post-punk bands, was sort of exemplified by the landscape of tower blocks. That this, Manchester bands in particular, um, had this thing, on the one hand, of being totally fascinated by it, and it would always appear in their videos and record covers, um, and on the one hand, considering it really, really bad and evil and wrong. Um, a contradiction that I think is complex, but I think for them it was a sort of image of the new of the new and terrifying future that on the one hand 
they wanted to resist, and on the other hand, they, they, they found quite sexy. Um, and there's a whole load of other ways that it kind of influences culture, which I won't get into. Um, but punk really, really cements this, this identification of modernism with urban decay, with decline, with the sort of um, the failure, a failure of a kind of moment of, of utopianism and planning um, that inevitably uh, went wrong, as Paul Weller puts it. Um, next to this, we have um, the former Prime Minister, Tony Blair, and a well-placed policeman. Um, touring the Aylesbury estate, another large Greater London Council housing estate, this one in, in, uh, in between the Elephant and Castle and Peckham in southeast London, um, which is still there, uh, partly cleared. Um, and when elected in 1997, the first place that Blair went to as Prime Minister was the Aylesbury estate and gave this speech about what, what was described as social exclusion. It wasn't called poverty anymore. Poverty was a thing that happened to people. Social, ex social exclusion, exclusion was kind of their fault a little bit. Um, and gave a speech in which he said that there would be no forgotten places. So places like the Aylesbury estate for Blair were places that had sort of fallen off the map. Actually, the Aylesbury estate is right in the center of London. Um, it's very, very well placed. The bus will take you to the Houses of Parliament in 10 minutes. It's about 45 minutes walk from the centre of London. There are several tube stations nearby. It's very, very well connected. And yet somehow it's fallen off the map. People there are socially excluded. It's a ghetto. I mean, apparently it's odd that it would be considered a ghetto because it's one of the most multicultural places on earth. But this was the idea. Um, so... Again, something had to be done. Something had to be done. And rather than just kind of let these places rot, which had been very much the idea of the Thatcher government of the 1980s, that they would just be left to, to decline and die, that action should be taken in them. And without wanting to make this too dense, um, an important bit of background in this that really, really can't be avoided is the effects of a policy brought in in 1980 uh, called the right to buy. Um, so essentially, most of this housing was constructed by um, elected local authorities and then rented out at a quite low rent to people on a waiting list. Um, from, 90, from the 80s onwards, you could, as a resident, buy your flat. And you could buy it at a, a, a lowered rate. So you would be buying it at much less than its market value. And the, the money from that was then kept by central government. It was not given to the local governments who had actually built th the stuff. And it was a quite deliberate policy to, um, to kind of spread market values into an area which was previously socialized. And initially to kind of buy off a section of the, of the, of the working and middle class who, who lived in council housing, that they could become property owners. And property owners, it was assumed, would vote conservative. And given that something very, very similar um, happened to housing in, in 1991 in the then Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, this is an issue which I imagine you face. So um, what this essentially did was made the, um, the least popular housing uh, increasingly full of people that were just poor. So council housing before 1980 actually housed quite a lot of different kinds of people. Um, but from then on, the stuff that was most popular and that appealed to people that were, to use the jargon, aspirational, increasingly was in the private sector. Leaving in the public sector, mainly those estates which were least popular. And in the 1980s and 1990s, that meant brutalism. And that meant high-rises, walkways, maisonettes, and all of the things that kind of went along with, with brutalism. So, I'm kind of, the, the temporality of this is a bit leapt suddenly from 1997 to, to now. <coughs> 
Um, this is one of several kind of short case studies I'll, I'll, I'll go through um, of different fates of, um, of sort of famous brutalist buildings. So this is, um, as I'm sure some of you will know, Robin Hood Gardens, designed by Alison and Peter Smithson, who were um, arguably, you, you know, the kind of main brutalist architects, partly responsible for coining the term brutalism, so very, very central to it. Um, not that great as actual architects, but great as theorists. Um, most of their ideas are much better used by other architects, such as the architects of Park Hill in Sheffield, which I will come to again in a moment. Um, so this was a really, really, really straightforward case, this one. This was really, really simple. So you had, um, so Robin Hood Gardens was two blocks. There's one of those two um, in a quite sort of textured, complex concrete um, around a open space um, surrounded with very, very loud main roads. Um, and because of that, very, very insular, very much kind of based around this, this kind of green central space and quite hostile to the area around it because the area around it was hostile. Um, and um, about seven years ago, the owners of the building, uh, Tower Hamlet Council, um, so one of the poorest councils in Britain, one of the poorest local authorities in Western Europe, um, decided to um, sell the site of Robin Hood Gardens to developers. And the developers would then um, provide a percentage of social housing, which it was assumed that residents would be able to move to. Actually, in practice, this, was usually st this stuff was usually too expensive. Um, and the density would be massively increased. So there'd be much more flats on the site. But because the, th th this had been sold on the open market and developers had sort of bought it, and Tower Hamlets would make some money, and they would still manage to um, rehouse the people that lived there. Um, and when this was announced, um, a petition was begun by the Architectural Weekly Building Design um, that was immediately signed by almost every famous architect in the world. Rob Richard Rogers, Zaha Hadid, Peter Eisenman, Daniel Lieberskind, um, you name them, they signed this petition, demanding that Robin Hood Gardens be saved from the bulldozer. Um, and this was perhaps not the best way of saving in Robin, Robin Hood Gardens, because immediately Tower Hamlet's council phrased the question as being middle-class architects who would love, you know, who like this, this architecture but would never dare live in it, um, demanding that people live in this awful, dilapidated, miserable, damp-filled building um, and trying to stop them from moving into their wonderful new homes. Actually, very little of them were going to move into these new homes anyway, and they weren't that wonderful. But it, it made it, the, the way that it was all phrased as a question of architecture rather than the question of, of social policy meant that um, the council managed to kind of be able to quite convincingly argue that they represented the people's wishes against the wishes of a bunch of middle-class aesthetes. Now, when this is actually juxtaposed with what's going to be built there, I think the, the argument is a little less simple. It was always kind of taking place in the abstract. This quite worn building that hadn't been renovated in about 35 years was, you know, quite difficult to kind of see what the architects liked in it, unless you were already interested in brutalism. Um, but what wasn't usually shown was the incredibly banal ultra high density kind of generic corporate architecture that was going to be built on the site. This, this was never usually juxtaposed. Um, another example, Thamesmead, um, which we've already looked at um, in the form of the propaganda film, then in the form of um, droogs getting thrown into the lake. Um, another example of um, you know, the, the, the sort of destruction of this, of this stuff 
allegedly in favor of something for ordinary people, but which would all, again, was much, much higher density, what's, what was proposed, um, of much less architectural interest. The flats were usually smaller, and it was much, much less likely that anyone that lived in one of the original buildings at Thamesmead was going to get to live in any of the new ones. But again, a kind of very, very populist campaign legitimized this. Um, when they first started demolishing bits of Thamesmead, the local press, the South London press, um, had a banner headline saying, no more, clockwork or no more clockwork orange, which I think is very interesting. Um, that the, the portrayal of this, fil of this area as a sort of science fiction dystopia um, sort of stuck to it so much that, that this is how it was seen it being demolished. This was clockwork orange, and so it was a good thing that it was being demolished. Um, whether this rule would be extended to other parts of London, I don't really know. Whether areas where people get killed in, 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 uh, you know, in 19th century novels would be demolished because of this, I don't really know. If, you know, imagine some sort of um, 19th century Gothic house being demolished because it features in Dracula or something. No more Dracula. This was not likely to happen. Um, but in the case of brutalism, the kind of fiction, a fictional portrayal of those buildings and the actual buildings are sort of melded together in the, in, in, in the eyes of the media. Um, so, another thing that's, I think, probably worth drawing attention to is that the housing association that are currently developing Thamesmead, at the head of it, specifically said, when you drive through Thamesmead, you see nothing of architectural quality. Um, which is interesting, given that Thamesmead features, I think, in every single history of 20th century British architecture, but anyway. So, um, so those are two, two kind of casualties, and there are others you could talk about as well, but those are two really high-profile casualties, um, sort of iconic and famous brutalist buildings facing the bulldozer. Um, the others I'm going to talk about are buildings that, that are actually face, that have faced some sort of renovation. Um, and have been restored into something like their original form. Um, so, the one at the top is Keeling House, which was designed by Dennis Lauston in the late 1950s. And it's interesting because its, its form was dictated very, very much by its social function. It was a building which attempted to use an aesthetic to express an ethic, as it were. So, um, Lasden did various bits of sociology on the site. It's an area in East London in Bethnal Green that was you know, very, very famous and sort of quite notorious in some ways, working class area. And he believed that if you built a kind of standard tower, enclosed tower, um, that you wouldn't, you wouldn't get proper community in the block. And the sort of... Um, close family and, 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 and community life that you get in the east end of London would be disrupted. So, allegedly, the cluster of the design um, would, would allow people to have a kind of community spaces. So, each of these sort of little cubes is a sort of house within a grid, and within the kind of central part of it where the lifts are, there's quite large spaces where people will be encouraged to put their washing, or they'd be encouraged to talk to other residents and so forth. And the idea would be that these would, these would kind of put into the, sort of, uh, 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 into the tower block something of the kind of life of the street. Um, to what degree it was successful in that is quite a matter of, of, of controversy. Um, but by the time it was uh, closed, the building was mainly inhabited by elderly residents who did find that the area had quite a lot of community spirit. They'd lived there for a long time, they knew their neighbors, and so forth. The building was listed in the late 1990s. So the listing process essentially means that you can't really legally demolish a building. It's a sort of standard historical protection law. Apart from an exceptional circumstance, you can't demolish a listed building. Um, but what you then have to do is then any changes that are made to the building, any upgrades, have to be in accordance with, um, with listed building guidelines. So you can't 
you can't put cladding on it. You can't do the straightforward thing that's done in a lot of places when you renovate a modern building of kind of putting um, kind of brightly colored insulation panels or styrofoam. You can't do that on a listed building. So the council that owned it, again, Tower Hamlets, um, claimed that they couldn't afford the, the renovation. They, they themselves would not be able to do this off their own budget, which is probably true. Um, so they sold the building to property developers who then renovated it, built two very small penthouses at the top, which you can just about see at the top, um, and gated it. That's really, really crucial. They then gated it. So it had gone from being a place that kind of was supposed to express what East End communities being a place that was literally walled off from the East End community. Um, but in the process, it became very, very appealing to um, what was then being known, so this is about 2000, 2001, as the uh, creative class. Uh, it was specifically marketed at people that worked in media, the arts, design, music. Um, persistent rumor has it that Damon Albarn lives at the top. Um, whether this is true or not, I don't know. I was set him down as more of a West London man, but I imagine he can probably afford more than one block of flats due to the fact that Blur and Gorillas were so wonderful. And um, so that, in many ways, is the sort of thing that those that were signing the petition to save Robin Hood Gardens, believed should happen to Robin Hood Gardens. Um, the philosopher, philosopher, Al Alain de Botton, um, specifically mentioned in the petition, you know, that Keeling House and this, the Brunswick Center, um, showed what could be done with brutalist buildings. These, the, the, you know, these were the things that could, that could happen. Not very likely to appeal to residents, because what happened to Keeling House is that the people that lived there were moved out and rich people were moved in. Not that appealing. Um, what happened at the Brunswick Centre is more complicated. So the Brunswick Centre is another brutalist building in London which appears in cinema. Um, it features briefly in Antonioni's film The Passenger. Um, Jack Nicholson actually sits on one of these benches um, waiting for Maria Schneider. Um, and it was kind of, it's roughly one half a council housing scheme and one half a shopping center. So the housing, based on partly on um, the futurist projects of Antonio Santelia, um, was owned by uh, Camden Council, by, so by the, the kind of local, local authority. And the shopping was owned by shopping development. And um, in around 2006, this was um, bought up by a large shopping mall developer um, who kind of turned it into quite a high-end shopping center um, with, you know, sort of boutiques and kind of slightly posher than usual chain restaurants and that sort of thing. Um, with the obvious effect that those flats that were uh, still owned by the local authority um, could potentially be enormously expensive. So um, if you are living in a council flat on one of these, on one of the publicly owned flats, um, you'll be paying, I think, fairly low rent. Um, probably, I don't imagine, much more than about 400 euros a month. Um, but if you are, um, the, the private flats that are sold are sold for very, very large sums of money indeed. A flat on the Brunswick Centre was recently sold for a million pounds. Um, so a sort of social stratification sort of happens within those buildings now. And they, they, you know, the design quality of them becomes one of the reasons why they're so expensive. Um, you know, you're not just moving into any old uh, council estate. You're moving into somewhere that's iconic, that's an architectural icon, that's listed, that's important, and so forth. The place where this happens most spectacularly is Park Hill in Sheffield, which you saw its current incarnation at the start. Now, the story of Park Hill is enormously complicated, and I could go on about it for ages, and I will try not to. Um, but here, so a similar thing to Keeling House, of it being a, a housing estate that was supposed to sort of design into the fabric of the building, the kind of community life that allegedly existed on, on, on the kind of 
original terraced streets. Um, and this has been very much a component of the kind of ethic part of brutalism, that it was very much against this kind of um, platonic garden city idea of kind of large open green spaces and quiet and order. And it wasn't supposed to be quiet and order, it was supposed to be bustling and noisy and have street life. This is very much part of what brutalism was about. Um, and Park Hill was enormously famous and imitated at, in its time. Um, also got listed in the late 1990s. And rather than being bought by a developer, it was actually given to a developer because it was considered impossible that anyone would actually buy it. Um, who have been undergoing a, uh, and who have been undertaking a kind of progressive block by block refurbishment of it, um, in which the new private flats will be marketed or are being marketed specifically to uh, creatives. So you saw that earlier on in that clip of you know them talking about warp films is there, Uber is there because massively exploiting cab drivers is creative as we all know. Um, and um, and the kind of form had to change in, in the process. Um, the original building was a bit too stark, a bit too gray, a bit too rough. Um, so some sort of brightly colored panels were put into it. Um, there was some sort of shiny additions. Not all of this was actually built. Um, but this gives you an idea of what the vision was for Park Hill. Um, it's also worth stressing something really interesting that happened in Park Hill when they renovated it, which is that um, for the first time there was concrete inside the flats. So it was considered by brutalist architects that whether or not you had concrete inside the flat was totally irrelevant. What people did in the flat was their business. Um, but in the kind of refurbished, um, kind of new parts of Park Hill, um, there's an enormous amount of bare concrete in the interior. Um, and I think that's, that, 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 that's quite crucial. That the concrete of the building has become in itself a kind of fetish object. It's part of the deal. It's part of what you're buying. Um, you're sort of buying this kind of particular kind of, uh, you know, sort of concrete chic. Um, these two, I think, sort of show two quite contrasting ways of um, going about renovating a brutalist high-rise. So these two are occasionally, I think not entirely correctly, claimed to be inspiration for the Genex Tower in Belgrade. Don't think that's actually true. Not much evidence that they actually were. But um, yeah, I think you can see what they mean. There's a quite similar approach to form and quite similar approach to the expression of services, in particular that kind of typical brutalist thing of the expression of services. Um, so these two were built consecutively in very, very different parts of London. This one, Balfour Tower, was built in the East End. Um, and the slightly later Trellick Tower, um, which is quite similar in form, not identical, sometimes wrongly considered to be identical, um, is built in West London, in an area which at the time it was built was quite poor, but near to several very wealthy areas. And by the 1990s was a rich area. Um, particularly via Richard Curtis's film starring Hugh Grant and Julia Roberts about the area Notting Hill in which there were astonishingly no black people. Um, so um, the process by which Trellick Tower was, um, was renovated and was, um, became a success was actually um, in many ways, quite, quite worthwhile, quite interesting, I think. Um, in the 1970s, Trellick Tower was very, very much demonized. It was referred to as the tabloid press, by the tabloid press as the Tower of Terror. Um, and basically what happened to it in the 1980s is that it had a very powerful tenants association. Um, and that tenants association managed to convince the council that owned it, Kensington and Chelsea, to uh, pay for a concierge. So there was a concierge at all hours on the ground floor. And they also introduced a policy that people would be rehoused on Trellick Tower only if they wanted a flat on Trellick Tower. So um, if you came up on the council waiting list and you didn't want to live in Trellick Tower, you wouldn't be rehoused on Trellick Tower. You'd be on there if you actually particularly wanted to live in that building. 
which it turned out, to the surprise of some people, people did. Um, you had fantastic views, the flats were huge, the materials were very good, it was very well connected. Um, you know, actually, there were all sorts of reasons why people wanted to live on Trellick Tower. And already in the 80s and 90s, people become quite surprised by this, that actually it worked. And it was probably the first brutalist building which became kind of popular, um, both for the general public and with estate agents. Um, but, and I think that's a transformation which in many ways came from the residents themselves. However, the, um, the right to buy, again, kind of had caused certain problems in it. So it is now, I think, I think still 70% council housing. So 70% publicly owned, people paying very low rents. But the other 30%, again, flats go for a million. So it's um, partly private. A sort of, a, a kind of, uh, a sort of slow privatization. What happened to Balfron Tower and what's happening to it now is a much, much faster privatization, a much more dramatic privatization. Um, and I think it sort of shows in many ways the sort of effects of, the possible effects of the kind of popularity of, 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 of brutalism. Although, again, some of this is simply questions of money. To Kem Kensington and Chelsea Council have lots of it. Tower Hamlets Council, who own Balfron Tower, do not. Um, so they um, gave the building to a housing association who initially claimed that they would res renovate the building. That was part of the promises to residents that they would, who had to vote about it being transferred, um, that they told residents they'd renovate the building. Then when they assessed it and found out how much it would cost to restore a listed building, um, they decided that they would sell the flats in there to pay for the renovation of other buildings in the area, so other housing estates. Um, it would be a sort of form of kind of cross-financing. That this would be, um, you know, such a money spinner. People would buy flats in there for a million pounds and so forth. That then, you know, almost the entire area's housing could be upgraded. Um, the sort of trickle-down theory of, of, of architectural renovation, I guess you could say. But what's really funny about what happened to Balfour Tower is that they had a little interim stage in this. So for the last kind of three years, they've been sort of moving out the actual residents of the tower who were the, the actual council tenants and moving in artists. Um, and artists could get cheap studios there. Um, in many ways, it was an offer you couldn't refuse. You know, you're basically told by a housing association, do you want a studio that has some of the best views in London and one of the best buildings in London, and do you want to pay very, very little money for it? I don't resent anybody for saying yes. But um, this kind of was a way of accelerating the process that, of, of gentrification. And I think that's quite interesting, it being that kind of, that kind of top down. That usually an area gradually, it's assumed, becomes popular with with artists, people in media, designers, etc. cetera, um, that gradually that happens, and then gradually the rents rise, and then gradually the real rich, the actually rich, start being attracted to the area. Um, you, know, you, you know what happens. Um, but here, um, this was all condensed into like about a three-year period and, and directed. Um, they'd worked out that this happens, and they wanted to force it to happen in order to make sure that the, that the new flats would sell for a sufficiently large amount because people would have been attracted by the kind of cultural cachet created by its transformation into an artist space. So most of what I've been talking about is housing, which I think is not entirely fair. As there's various, uh, various other examples of... Um, in brutalism is obviously not just about housing, although I think housing was probably more important in brutalism than, than the other typology was. So just quickly, here are two buildings that were major kind of core celebs um, in the last 10 years in Britain, um, both of which were initially refused listing. Um, so the one at the top, which is quite rightly very famous, is the South Bank Center, um, part of the kind of cultural complex that was built up in the kind of welfare state years quite gradually with the Royal Festival Hall and the National Theatre, also part of it. Um, and this is brutalism at its most brutalist, I guess. It's, it, it's a very, very aggressive form, very, very much discordant, 
completely anti-symmetrical, the material's being very, very deliberately rough. Um, this is not the kind of crafted concrete you get on an Erno Goldfinger building on, on something like Trellick Tower. This is a really, really, really rough, deliberately quite cheap concrete. Um, and again, it was hated for years and years and years and gradually became popular. And currently, the main idea of what to do with it seems to be to sort of turn it into a place where fun happens. Um, and in many ways, that's probably quite close to the original idea. Some of the architects who designed it were also an archigram, famous for their walking cities and other such kind of hippie ideas. And um, here you can see two of relational aesthetics kind of playground maker, Carsten Hola's slides stuck to it. Um, so that was the kind of response there, to kind of make it quite jolly while still keeping some of the original fabric. Um, below that is a brutalist building of, uh, of much higher quality in terms of materials and architecture um, in the northern industrial town of Preston. Um, so this immense bus station, um, a sort of combined sort of bus station, um, car park and various other things with cafes and, and so forth and a hairdresser inside. Um, was slated to be demolished about five years ago and replaced with a shopping mall. Um, the effects of the 2008 economic crisis meant that the shopping mall no longer got built. And mysteriously, after having been refused several times, suddenly the government agreed to list it, which might have had something to do with the fact that commercial interests were no longer interested. Um, so in many ways, this one is a, a, a quite a success in that actually it was saved um, from the bulldozer. Um, there's still a kind of enormous question about what, what then happens to it. I was last there only about a month ago, and it's in a state of quite advanced dilapidation. It's, it's, it's you know, not quite as bad as Belgrade bus station, but around the same kind of, not hugely dissimilar in its level of dilapidation. Um, and so there's, a, there's been a kind of architectural competition recently to kind of work out what to, what to do with it, and how to renovate it, and so on. And at the moment, it's still kind of in between. It's been saved, but it can't actually be, be, be cleaned. Um, so that, that, that's the end of the kind of case studies, I think, that, 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 that I'd like to have gone through about, about, about brutalism. But um, I just want to end with some examples, I think, of the, the recent marketing of brutalism and the recent kind of wave of, uh, 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 of popularity of brutalism. Um, and what and what that means. So, these are two um, typical images from the Tumblr. Fuck yeah, brutalism. Um, if you're not familiar with it, its address is very straightforward. Fuck yeah, brutalism. Tumblr. Etc. Um, so, fuck yeah, brutalism consists of a very 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 simple um, formula, which is. You have a black and white photo of a brutalist building from the original time. It's always from the original time. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of images now on fuck yeah brutalism. And there's even a book, um, like there's a, the um, journal Clog put out a, a special brutalism issue that was basically uh, fuck yeah brutalism as a book. Um, and so there's always an image from the original time in kind of glorious monochrome. Um, here is the Alton Estate as one of them. I can't remember what the other one is. That was just randomly taken from the most recent. Um, so it's always in black and white. It's always elegant. It's always from the time. So it has no sign of what's happened to those buildings in the interim. They don't weather. They don't age. And most of all, they don't have people. That's a really, really crucial thing. If you see a person on Fuck Yeah Brutalism, I will personally buy you a drink. Um, it's completely a sort of depopulated science fiction landscape, um, the landscape of fuck yeah brutalism. Um, and I think that's, in many ways, quite, <laughs> quite a strange approach to make to this architecture. As I sort of tried to stress, quite a lot of the idea about brutalism was, first of all, that, it, that the architecture would be quite rough and quite very much about kind of taking things as you find them. So the idea that they, these buildings would weather and get dirty was almost the point. They were meant to get dirty. Um, they were meant to become a bit messy. That was almost part of the idea. 
and that works uh, with varying degrees of success depending on how well the concrete was poured. Um, and also it was supposed to be a social architecture. It was supposed to have this sort of street life and noise and so forth. Um, but in these, it's always just a pure image of architectural elegance and a pure image of kind of concrete fetishism. The concrete's always in monochrome, you know, and there's always this kind of um, sense of what's this for? What's this about? And it, and it, it becomes purely a kind, of, a kind of formalism, purely about the enjoyment of this particular historical form, completely divorced from any kind of social context. Which I think in the British example, certainly, maybe not in all others, in the British example, certainly, um, papers over, I think, what is a still ongoing social issue. This point, I'm going to be quite, quite mean. I don't really want to be mean about this, especially as I'm on, on film, being on camera here, which I hadn't thought of when I put the, the, s the slides together. But anyway, I'm going to hope he doesn't see this. So um, these are two pages from a book um, called This Brutal World, published recently by Thadem. Um, any design shop now, I think, will will have this or will have it. Um, I, it will be one of the hits of the of the 2010s, I think, in architectural publishing. Um, and it's another thing based on a Tumblr. I think it's very interesting how many of these things are based on Tumblr, because Tumblr is so much about just the constant on on rush of images, another lot, and cl click and click and click and click, and more and more images. And context is really, really the enemy with Tumblr. Context would kind of get in the way of that, of that kind of like, wow, next picture. It's sort of architectural porn, really. Um, so, so he managed. So the 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 the, the 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 guy that ran the this brutal house Tumblr, the graphic designer Peter Chadwick, um, designed covers including that for Screamer Delica by Primal Scream. Um, was sort of recently turned into a book. And what it consists of is, is buildings that are sometimes brutalist, not always actually brutalist, um, juxtaposed with quotes. Um, so here, I'm sorry, <laughs> I, I find it funny, maybe I shouldn't. Um, here you have a concrete factory by Eric Mendelssohn, actually from the 20s, with the quote from Nick Cave, out of sorrow entire worlds have been built, out of longing great wonders have been willed. Um, and next to it, you have various concrete buildings, including, bizarrely, the Falkirk Wheel, a hydroelectric structure in Scotland. You have Anne Rand, not someone you would imagine would be a fan of public housing, social projects, labor governments, given Anne Rand's entire philosophy was about the denial of the existence of the social. Um, or the social purely as a form of repressing great geniuses like Anne Rand herself. Um, the, 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 the fact that she is being used as a quote on brutalism is quite weird. Um, but anyway, there she is. Uh, the question isn't who is going to let me, it's who is going to stop me. Um, so there you go. Um, and I think that's, th those two, I think, are examples of, I think, in many ways, the sort, of the sort of climate in which the sort of debate about brutalism is often taking place, uh, being very much about um, deliberate de decontextualization, not an accidental decontextualization. This stuff isn't just happening to not be discussed along with its social content. That's really the point. Um, and to be fair to Peter Chadwick, I think he's, he's quite explicit about this in his book. He's like, you know, I'm redefining the word brutal to mean not just stuff that's officially brutalism, but to mean any architecture that's really big and aggressive and stuff. I'm like, well, okay, fine. Um, so I think the consequences of what happens when you strip out all of that social context is that you don't have to then feel uncomfortable about what's happening to those buildings now. You don't have to feel uncomfortable about the fact that they are at the heart of literal social cleansing. The fact that thousands of people are moved out, either by hook or by crook, of brutalist buildings to make way for rich incomers. You cannot think about that. It's a way of kind of tipping, but this is really just about buildings. It's just about aesthetics. It's art for art's sake. Um, so here, you know, here is a flat currently offered for sale on Zoopla in the Brunswick Center for about a million quid. 
And here is a recent advertising slogan for Park Hill. This is much more of what it currently looks like than the other one. Um, where one of the architects of its transformation says, we wanted to capture more permanently that moment of vision, optimism, and personality that seemed to have been lost. And I think that's, that's great. That, that explains exactly what this is about. That the way of capturing the, the vision, optimism, and personality of brutalist architecture is to remove the people that live there, the people that don't have enough personality, they don't have optimism, and they don't have vision. The vision is to get them out. And there, I will stop. I'm not totally sure of the relevance of this to, to Belgrade's particular problems with, with this architecture and with the sort of planning. So really, this is a kind of like, you know, in 20 years, you may, or five years, depends on the success of the Belgrade waterfront, I'm sure, um, you may be facing this particular question. So be careful. Thank you. So if anyone has questions they want to ask, please do. Or you can ask me afterwards. I'll probably be hanging around. It's up to you. Anybody? All right, you can go home now. Cheers. <laughs>